Uh, All right, let's get started. Oh, yeah. Last time we were talking about uh, uh, organohaline compounds and the reactions they undergo. And so recall that um, there are two basic uh, directions that an organohalide, an alkyl halide, uh, can take. And that is either to react with something electron rich, a nucleophile, to do a substitution reaction, or to react with something electron rich that's reacting as a base to deprotonate and eventually lose, uh, also lose the leaving group and form a double bond, so elimination reactions. Um, and as we saw, these aren't simple reactions, right? They're, they're pretty complicated in the fact that um, there are many different factors which control exactly how each of these directions take place. Um, in substitution reactions, there's two uh, main mechanisms by which that can take place. Either the carbon-halogen bond breaks first to form an intermediate carbocation, uh, and then that intermediate reacts with some nucleophilic species to put the substituted group on. So that's a two-step reaction. Um, or the reaction can take place all in one step, where both the halide uh, bond is breaking um, but not fully broken at the top of that energy well, but uh, it's partly broken. At the same time, the nucleophile bond is coming in, so that bond is forming. And that can happen simultaneously. Uh, and there are different consequences in the result for these two pathways. So recall that um, a carbocation is completely flat, so planar. Um, and if you do have stereochemistry in the starting material, so if you start with a chiral alkyl halide, what you'll end up with is a racemic product. Because that intermediate loses all of the stereochemical information. There is no three-dimensional difference or stereoisomers in that intermediate. So that information then of the, where the position in three dimensions the original halide was is lost. Whereas if the reaction is taking place in one step, the halide isn't gone completely when the nucleophile starts forming a bond. So the position and the orientation of the carbon that it's attached to um, is, remains intact. That is, the iodide takes up one specific place in three dimensions as it's coming off in this example. The nucleophile has to come in from the backside uh, 180 degrees from that in that trajectory in order for the reaction to actually occur. So what happens in terms of the stereochemistry, although I've just used methyl, uh, methyl iodide in this case, but if it were a chiral molecule, you would get inversion, inversion of the configuration. So if you start with an R iodide, you'd end up with an S alcohol in this particular example. Okay. So those are the two substitution mechanisms, um, and we refer to these two mechanisms by their uh, acronyms. So in the first example, which is a two-step process, this is the SN1 reaction. And I'll refer to that a lot in a lot of different contexts. In the upcoming chapter, we're going to start today on alcohols. We'll talk about um, carbocations. And so we have similar intermediates. The second one here is that happens in one step, where we come where we combine both of the things together in the rate determining step, it's only one step. This is an SN2 reaction. So nucleophilic substitution second order versus first order. Question? Uh, I forget what RDS stands for, the first one. What is what? RDS in the... Uh... Ah, that stands for the rate determining step, the slowest step in the mechanism. Oh, okay. RDS is rate determining step. So. If you have more than one step, of course, then you have to know which one is the slowest, right? In order to know what what impacts the overall rate of the reaction. So it is the formation of the carbocation, which is the important, the slowest step. And that so so that means the rate of the reaction doesn't depend on the nucleophile, which is in the second step. Okay, it only depends on one molecule, SN1. We have that arrow pointing to H2O. What is that negative H plus? 
Ah, sorry. Um, in the end, notice I've added water to the carbocation. So I've cheated here. I haven't drawn all the details. Obviously, uh, did everyone hear the question? The question is, what is this minus H plus? It means I've lost a uh, proton. Um, so you notice we have OH in the product, but we have H2O as the nuclear bomb. So what happens actually, if you want the details here, is that water reacts with the carbocation, and the first thing you form, if I can draw, would be that. Okay. So then in order to get actually to the product, the proton has to come off. So that just means we've lost the proton. Question? So just to be sure, the difference between the two is in the second reaction, hydroxide is added to both. It's all happening in one step. This is not an intermediate. This is just the transition state. So the, the second reaction, this is all happening in one step, the bond breaking and the bond making. Okay, so that is not at any point both connected to iodine and hydroxide. At, at the transition stage, yeah. there's bonding to both, yes. Okay. One is breaking and departing, and one is forming. And not coming I get it. Yeah, again, that's a transition state, not an intermediate. It happens along the reaction path as we just see where atoms are moving throughout the reaction. Okay, so substitution reactions. Now, based on these two mechanisms, different things are important that favor one or the other, right? So if you need to, if the important thing is to form a carbocation intermediate, Okay, the stability of that intermediate is going to dictate the success of the reaction. <coughs> Following me? Okay, whereas in the second case, um, if the nucleophile has to come in before the leaving group has left, what's going to be really important is trying to achieve this transition state where we have the nucleophile coming in, so the crowdedness will matter a lot. If it's too crowded, it's going to be really slow or not work. And that is opposite for SN1 and SN2. Carbocations are more stable if you have more groups attached. And uh, so that works best when it's more substituted. If it's less substituted, it's less crowded, so the SN2 process, the second reaction, would be favored. So if we compare the two, um, the differences are uh, quite nice. We can predict, um, based on that substitution of the alkyl halide of the substrate that we're reacting, the organic substrate, uh, which mechanism it should go by. Because if it's tertiary, it can't do SN2, I'm sorry, it can't do SN1 very well. Secondary maybe a little, but it really is the tertiary substrates will do SN1. They will form carbocations. Whereas the secondary and primary substrates are very difficult to form carbocations relative to tertiary, so these will favor SN2 conditions. So that's actually one of the most important things about substitution reactions that help uh, dictate which direction the reaction will, which mechanism the reaction will undergo. Okay, and then that has consequences, particularly in stereochemistry, if we start with stereochemistry at the beginning. The other pathway, elimination, can also occur, um, and we've seen three mechanisms. Two of these are very similar uh, to the substitution mechanisms we talked about. We have in one case a mechanism where the first step is just loss of the leaving group to form the halide, and that forms an intermediate carbocation. Okay, so the exact same issues that are important for the SN1 substitution reaction also are here present in the E1 elimination reaction. In E1, elimination first of all. Again, since it's stepwise, any base is only involved, any other molecule is only involved in the second step. The first step is the slowest rate determining step. And the rate only depends on loss of the halide from the starting material. So the more substituted it is, the easier that can occur. 
So tertiary substrates can undergo E1 elimination, formation of a carbon cation. The only difference between this and a substitution is instead of a nucleophile, which adds and forms a bond to where the carbon cation is, instead, it, it, the negatively charged species reacts as a constant base and takes off a proton adjacent to the carbon. Because then the electrons from the CH bond flow down, neutralize the plus charge, and that's what forms the, the pi bond between the two carbons. Okay? I know I've had the, some students um, have some problems with the homework and how those those electron arrows are being drawn. And one of the one of the problems did have something like this that you had to show this arrow and you had to show this arrow going to that bond, forming a double bond in between. So if you had trouble with that homework problem, try drawing the electrons towards the bond, not the carbon. That's a two-step reaction, E1. The reaction can all take place simultaneous. That is, the base can start taking the proton off at the same time the electrons between the CH are flowing down to form the double bond at the same time the CX bond leaves. So if it's happening all in one step, then somewhere along the line you'll reach a transition state where you have partial bonding um, bonds making and bonds breaking, which I've indicated here with just the dotted lines. Those are all the bonds which are either being formed in the process of being formed or being broken. Okay. In the end, we formed a new bond between the base and the, and the proton. We formed the new pi bond and we've lost the halide. Now, what do you think might be important for this mechanism to take place? How much does the substitution on the carbon with the halide matter? Not much. Not like an SN2 substitution. Because your base, in this case, only needs to reach an adjacent proton. It doesn't need to react or get close to the carbon that the leaving group is leaving from. So that is one subtle difference between SN2 substrate substitution requirements versus the E2. This is the E2 mechanism. Okay, but what is important, the leaving group and the leaving group, the leaving group ability to leave it, obviously the weakness of that bond will matter, but it also has to be aligned properly with the CH bond, the newly formed uh, pi bond, and that leaving group. And so if you look at this transition state structure, uh, and I've, I've drawn it in the orientation it has to be, because for all these bonds to be changing at one time, they all have to be lined up 180 degrees apart and, and in the same plane, what we refer to as, remember the term anti, anti means opposite, periplanar means uh, both of those CH bond and the CX bond are in the same plane. But so not in that uh, organizational structure, say, uh, if the X halogen was on the same side as the hydrogen? Then it's very, very difficult. I, I can't say it doesn't work. There are rare examples where it does, but it's, it's higher energy and, one, and is very difficult because they're just of the space issues of the base and the leaving group. But this is the optimal arrangement. If, it, if it's orthogonal, or 90 degrees apart, or something other than 180, you won't get this to go in a single step. It'll go through a stepwise process of some kind. So it'll go E1. It would probably go E1 if that's possible, yes. That depends on carbocation stability. It could go by this third mechanism, which I've drawn on the bottom. If you have special situation where you can stabilize negative charge, you can go to the other extreme, where you can take the proton off. Here's two hydrogens here. That base could take the proton off and completely break the CH bond before any of the C, whatever leaving group bond is leaving. That has to be a poor leaving group, otherwise that would usually leave simultaneous. Um, like hydroxide, that's a poor leaving group. 
But if you form an intermediate carbanion, which has to be stabilized, as we talked about last time, this is a, a process which could, could take place. Your book presents this, I think, because this is a common mechanism which is found in biological eliminations chemistry. Um, so a lot of these hydroxy groups that get eliminated in biological systems and bio, biomolecules go through this mechanism. This is referred to as the E1CB mechanism, referring to base or carbanion. Um, I would say, uh, I think most important are these two mechanisms on the top that I'd like you to focus on. I'm, 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 so I'll tell you right now, for the exam or anything, I'm not going to ask details about this E1CB. Yes, you heard it from me right here. Okay, so those are the substitution and elimination reactions. And if we look at um, comparing all of those together, uh, there is no single one best answer in any situation usually. Uh, it's hard to predict, and oftentimes when we carry out reactions, we see mixtures of products. We see products which come from multiple mechanisms that could happen. So those reactions which form a carbocation could react either to do a substitution or an elimination. So if you look at SN1 versus E1, they both have the first step exactly the same. They both lose X to form a carbocation. Right? So then the question of which way the reaction goes from there depends on how strongly basic, uh, whether you have something that's a good base to take a proton or is it some, or the other species is better at forming a new covalent bond to do substitution. Okay, so oftentimes that very subtle differences dictate the difference between SN1 and E1. Uh, but what's for sure is that these reactions <coughs> work best, or you'll, you'll always have carbocations being formed in these cases, typically, typically when you have tertiary substrates. They're often favored. So um, primary substrates, no way are you going to form carbocations. Secondary substrates, it's okay, they can happen, but that often competes with substitution if you have a strong base or a strong nucleophile. In any case, if you have a strong base, if you have um, alkoxide, or you have bulky bases which can't be a good nucleophile that are strong bases, they will always favor elimination, usually through an E2 mechanism. Um, if you want to do substitution, you want to look for things which are better nucleophiles and less able to take a proton. I know that's a lot of details to remember. Um, I'm, I won't be, a lot of these are very gray areas, so when I ask questions, again, I'll give you a little heads up on, for the next exam. I will try to make it very clear uh, and ask questions specifically about one mechanism or another, or if I say, give me the SN2 products, or the products of an SN2 substitution or an E2 elimination, I'll dictate that, because I know this, this fine line and gray area between uh, these mechanisms can be sometimes hard for us to figure out. Yeah? Question? So basically, the stronger the base, the more likely it is to just outright steal a, a hydrogen rather That's than... That's right. Than exactly. Exactly. And that can happen with primary, secondary, or tertiary, because it just has to reach that proton. SN2 cannot work on tertiary substrates, though. That's, that's good news. Okay? I would encourage you to... Um, Look at the problems in the book, uh, and on OWL for reactions, looking at substitutions and eliminations, see if you can uh, get uh, familiar with the trends of the different kinds of reactions. I think that will help out a lot. Um, and bother Sandeep in the uh, SI sessions about this as well. Um, a lot of these reactions we've been talking about in this specific chapter are based on carbon-halogen bonds breaking or how we make them. Um, but notice, if you notice, some of the ways that we use to make 
organohalides were actually through substitution reactions when we had a leaving group which was an oxygen leaving group, right? We had an alcohol which we could make into a good leaving group either by protonation or by reaction with thionyl chloride or phosphorus tribromide. Um, those, but the actual displacement of the OH group, however we activate it, with a halide is a substitution reaction as well. So it's not just alkyl halides that do substitutions and eliminations. Okay, many things do substitutions and eliminations. If they can be good leaving groups um, and you have the right partners that you're reacting with. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about these other functional groups that have OH in them. So in this chapter 8, we're talking about alcohols. Um, and there's a specific, uh, I would say, a special alcohols which we refer to as phenols. Those are molecules with OH that are on an aromatic ring. Uh, and there are other things as well. So if we think about the structure and properties of alcohols, and related compounds. Um, we can have molecules, all kinds of molecules, where we have a carbon-oxygen bond. And compare all this essentially to the simplest oxygen molecule besides O2 would be water, right? If we compare alcohols to water, we see a lot of similarities. This could be a carbon group. Um, this could be a carbon, oxygen, hydrogen. All we've done relative to water is replace one of the hydrogens with a carbon. Okay, But structurally, the oxygen, there's still an OH group. Okay, When we have that oxygen directly attached to a benzene ring or an aromatic system, uh, the name for the simplest benzene ring is called phenol. So the class of phenols will be, and this, this just represents just generic, I could have substitutions wherever on the benzene ring. Um, so you have all kinds of different substitute benzene rings, but if it has an OH group, we refer to these as the phenols. Again, it's a COH molecule. Okay, it's technically an alcohol. And then if we replace the other hydrogen, also with some carbon group. This is uh, now a molecule which has carbons on both sides which we refer to as an ether functional group. Okay. Ethers are going to be significantly different than alcohols or water for one main reason. There is no proton on it. Okay. They are more stable, less uh, reactive. And not that we can't do reactions with them, and we'll see reactions of ethers. But oftentimes, ethers are used for solvents in reactions because they are much less reactive than other kinds of OH groups. Now these are the alcohols and ethers and uh, we'll see a little bit later that these also have comparisons. If you go down one on the periodic table, we have molecules which have sulfur. So we can have, instead of an alcohol, this is called a thiol. And if you have two carbon groups, this is called a sulfide. So thiols and sulfides are the sulfur analogs of alcohols and ethers. Okay, so that's, a, that's the functional group. What about it uh, leads to its properties? And how do we name these things? And how do we uh, think about doing reactions with them? There's a lot of questions on alcohols and what we need to think about. Um, and you'll see all kinds of names for alcohols. And, the, the general public uh, word, alcohol, is usually referring to this molecule, ethyl alcohol, which has two carbons and an OH group. That's the, the beverage, um, the fermented beverage would be contain ethyl alcohol, um, which is poisonous, by the way. Just want to point that out. <laughs> Everything is in, in the, uh, the right amounts, right? Um, but there are, but since alcohol, this generic term that is in the in the public, uh, really is a broad term for the whole class of molecules. So 
there can be many kinds of alcohols. Um, and so we name them, for example, here, methyl alcohol. Or wood spirits, sometimes referred to as wood spirits. Uh, that's the one that will make you go blind if you drink it. Uh, and that one's bad. That one's really poisonous. Yeah, well, that one is outright killing. Um, oh, yeah, I can if you take enough. Uh, I think a little bit will make you blind. Um, if you just try to distill this, and you and you always get a little bit of methyl alcohol in those fermentations, so if you concentrate that methyl alcohol, then you could have a real problem. So, um, but methyl alcohol uh, is also is a very useful solvent and and can do a lot of things. But notice some of these names. I'm naming these. If you remember your naming system. How do we identify a parent versus a substituent? In a substituent, we use the YL ending, right? I call this methyl alcohol or ethyl alcohol. It's saying the alcohol, the OH, is actually the parent, if you will, if you want to think about it this way. Um, actually, it is the functional class. But the parent is the alcohol, and then the carbon group is the substituent on that. And the, a lot of these simple alcohols, small alcohols, you see people commonly referring to them this way. Um, cyclopentyl alcohol, isopropyl alcohol, because this would be an isopropyl group versus a normal propyl alcohol, which would be one propanol. Um, tertiary butyl alcohol, four carbons that happens to have this particular orientation of the carbons. It's on a tertiary carbon. So we refer to alcohols also classified based on their substitution pattern, just like we did with alkyl halides, because that's going to dictate some of its reactivity and differences. Okay. So an alcohol and a tertiary carbon would be a tertiary alcohol. Um, but there is, of course, a systematic name. Uh, commonly, things might be named this way, but systematically, uh, the name for IUPAC naming puts an alcohol on the longest carbon and combines them as the parent. And we simply change the E at the end of methane, take the E off, and add OL to indicate the alcohol. So methyl alcohol, the actual IUPAC name is methanol, the OL. Cyclopentanol, cyclo, for the cyclopentyl alcohol. Isopropanol. By the way, that's rubbing alcohol. That's what you get as rubbing alcohol in the store. Isopropanol is actually propane 2-all because the OH group is on the number 2 carbon. When you have different isomers possible, constitutional isomers possible, you have to indicate the number. Um, so again, just like when we talked about early on uh, naming alkanes and and putting an alkenes where we put the number within the name, propane 2 all is the most modern way to do it. Um, but I learned before they had this name uh, ruling, and I would usually refer to this as 2-propanol. So you might see that, but again, this is the, the current IUPAC system would put the 2 within the name of the molecule. But you'll see things like this a lot, and you'll probably hear me say that too. Now, unlike halides, which don't have any priorities other than alphabetical priority or whatever, the alcohol actually does have a priority over alkyl substituents. So we, we would uh, number them based on where the alcohol is first, where the OH group is first, even if you could have lower numbers. And that's the one thing that's different than naming for any of the other functional groups we've talked about so far. So this molecule down here on the left uh, is numbered from the right side because that's the side nearest the closest OH. Okay. So it's a it's a hexane three all with a methyl group on the five carbon. Although if you were to number it from the other direction, overall you'd have lower numbers for this substituent. But the alcohol in this case does get precedent. Okay. If you have more than one alcohol, then you use, similar to other kinds of functional groups, we use diol or triol or tetraol, depending on the number of OH groups we have. Hopefully that's not too hard. 
Notice also, if you take these numbers out and just think hexane diol, if you were to have hexanol, you'd drop the E, but since you have a consonant now with a di tri tetra, then you, that E is back in. So you might have noticed that. Um, phenols. As I said, the, the, the alcohol on a benzene ring, the simplest one with just the OH group, is, is, has the IUPAC name of phenol. Anybody ever heard of phenol? Or phenol? It's, uh, you'll find it in antiseptic throat sprays and things like that. It's actually a health, uh, kind of an antiseptic uh, material. But notice if we have substituents on there, the parent is the phenol. Uh, the nitro group in this case would be relative to that as a substituent on phenol. Um, let's see, do I have... Oh, I didn't talk about OH as a substituent. There are occasions where we use the OH group um, not as part of the parent, but as a substituent. Uh, and so as a substituent, we would refer to that as a hydroxy group. Hydroxy. So you could, um, for example, although it's not correct because we use phenol, but this would be hydroxybenzene. Or, or orthonitro hydroxybenzene for the second one. So we could, you, we could uh, use hydroxy if it's used as a substituent sometimes. So that's a little bit about naming. Um, naming hopefully shouldn't be too difficult for alcohols. When we name ethers, uh, ethers are named simply using the word ether. Ether is the parent, and that just stands for the oxygen. So when we use the word ether in anything, it's the, uh, the oxygen in the middle, and then we name the groups that are attached to it as substituents. So in this case, we have methyl on one side and ethyl on the other. So that's methyl ethyl ether. Not too hard, right? Methyl ethyl ether. Um, here's isopropyl, that's this group. There's an isopropyl group. This is as a substituent of phenyl, so it's isopropyl phenyl ether. They also have a space in between each word, too, which is also a little different. So this, you know, consistency, who needs it, right? Mm -hmm. um, diethyl ether, this is actually often referred to just as ether. This is when, when people use the word generic ether word to refer to one molecule, they're referring to diethyl ether. Uh, this has quite a history, actually. It was used, um, it was used as a, uh, what do you call it, when you put people to sleep? Anesthetic. anesthetic, thank you. It was used as an anesthetic in the 19th century. Um, and that's ether. You probably might have heard of ether in that context, but that refers to diethyl ether. Commonly used solvent, um, it's quite volatile. I think it boils around 35 degrees or so. Uh, so just above room temperature. And uh, that's Celsius. Uh, and it's, it's used uh, quite a lot. Um, let's see, ethers. Also, as a substituent, we use the oxy substituent, but it's based on what is attached to it. So, for example, here's a methoxy group, um, and we could have two of them, uh, dimethoxybenzene. Here, we're naming this isopropoxy as a substituent on a larger molecule. That includes the oxygen. So, notice in this case, we're not using the word ether because the oxygen in this name is included in the substituent name. Okay? So that's ether naming. Any questions on naming in general? Yes? Um, so for that first one, it could be alphabetical ether? Uh, yeah, I think we should probably put that in alphabetical order. Ethyl methyl ether would be correct. Um, I, uh, oops, I don't have it on here. I have thought I had it here. There is another ether. Well, I probably have it later when we talk about making them and reactions. 
There's an ether that looks like this. Oops, where's my pen? Give me my pen. This ether. Everybody uses this ether every day. Do you know what this, uh, where this ether is used? Any idea? It's in your gas tank. This is added to gasoline, and it's abbreviated MTBE. <coughs> MTBE is added as an octane boosting agent in gasoline, and it's stands for methyl tertiary butyl ether. So we have a methyl on one side and a tertiary butyl on the other. Methyl tertiary butyl, MTB. So ethers are everywhere. Um, I think I have this again on another slide. The point of adding that to gasoline is? It increases the octane rating of the gasoline. So uh, octane is how much energy you get from the burning it and how well it burns. Okay, well what about the properties? As I said, it's, we have a lot of similarities between alcohols and water. Um, they are oxygens, they are oxygens with lone pairs, and there's also a hydrogen on that. So this could have a number of different uh, reactivity profiles. It's also a polar molecule. So overall, um, alcohol groups do have a dipole moment. Notice, um, oh, I don't even know what this is for. It's probably methanol. Uh, a dipole moment because the carbon-oxygen bond is polarized towards the oxygen, and the hydrogen-oxygen bond is also polarized towards the oxygen. So the oxygen in an alcohol is electron-rich. And the most electron-poor part of an alcohol actually is the hydrogen. Or the, it can react as an acid. So we could have acidic reactivity or basic reactivity, depending on what it's reacting with. So if an alcohol is reacting with something that's more acidic, it'll act as a base to take a proton. If it's reacting with something which is much less acidic or more basic, it'll give up a proton to the, to the stronger base, just like water, OH minus, H2O, H3O plus, Alcohols can do exactly the same thing. Okay, and that's what helps us lead to uh, chemistry that we see and observe with alcohols. Now, one of the interesting things about water, right, what's the boiling point of water? 100 degrees Celsius, 212 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the boiling point of water. Um, for such a small molecule with a molecular weight of 18, it has a pretty high boiling point, right? Alcohols, we see this also with a lot of alcohols, and that's due to um, a variety of forces which attract the molecules together, because when you go from the liquid phase to the gas phase, the molecules have to spread apart. Um, some of what we refer to are intermolecular forces, and, and we can talk a little bit about that, but I just want to point out when you have polar molecules, you certainly do have attractions between the, those polar molecules. They'll align to uh, have those dipoles uh, interact in opposite ways, so they essentially neutralize as much as possible. So plus is attracted to minus, minus is attracted to plus. This can happen from one end to end, or can happen side to side. Overall, polar molecules can be attracted to each other through their dipoles. Okay, does that explain differences in boiling point? Take a look at chloromethane versus, oh, I'm sorry, that should be methanol. The R is a CH3. So chloromethane versus methanol. Okay. They're both polar molecules. Chloromethane has a dipole of 1.9 device for the molecule. Alcohol, methanol, has a dipole of 1.7 device. So actually, chloromethane is more polar than methanol. But look at the boiling point difference. It's not just dipoles 
It's not just polar interaction. What is missing from chloromethane, which is present in water and in alcohols, is the hydrogen. And remember that hydrogen is somewhat acidic. Go back here. Notice the hydrogen here has a lot of blue color in the electrostatic map. It's a pretty acidic proton relative to alkane hydrogens, for example. So that hydrogen combined with a molecule which also has lone pairs which have a lot of electron density allow it to undergo hydrogen bonding. So there's more than just dipole interactions. There's a, a stronger force which attracts those molecules together. And that is what we refer to as hydrogen bonds. They're not really strong. Question? So wait, you said the difference is the hydrogen molecule, right? The hydrogen molecules, yes. Okay, um, but the chloromethane has hydrogen as well. Does it need to be a polar? They're alkane hydrogens. If you have a hydrogen attached to a really electronegative atom, then it's polarized. An alkane right, so hydrogen is polarized. Yeah. Hydrogen. Okay. Right. It has to be an acidic hydrogen, if you will. Yeah. So in this case, we have electron-rich lone pairs on the oxygen, and we have this electron-deficient hydrogen. Um, and so water and alcohols and molecules which have this kind of arrangement with a heteroatom, not a carbon, heteroatom with a lone pair and an acidic hydrogen can undergo hydrogen bonding. So uh, the attraction, of course, is from the lone pair of the oxygen to the partially positively charged hydrogen. Um, that does several things. It creates a bond of about 5 kilocalories per mole, which is really weak, uh, but it's much stronger than dipole interactions. And it can be really significant, especially if you get a whole bunch of them together. Um, well, we talked about DNA base pairs, right, earlier. DNA base pairs are held, one strand is held to the other, because those bases are heterocycles, they have NH bonds and carbonyl oxygen. So we also see hydrogen bonding between those. That's what holds our DNA pair uh, double strand together. A whole bunch of hydrogen bonds. You add up five kilocalories over many, 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 many times, you get a pretty strong attraction. Um, so actually, uh, if you think about this, um, when we have a solution of water or a solution of alcohols, we actually don't know where, which oxygen, which hydrogen is on. They actually are moving from one oxygen to another. This bond, hydrogen bonding, uh, let's say you have another hydrogen bond that comes from another side. Um, you can have hydrogens jumping from one oxygen to the other um, overall. And so if we use spectroscopic techniques like NMR spectroscopy, for example, that's happening faster than the NMR time scale, and so we don't see some of the effects that we would see if that hydrogen was stuck in one place. It's moving. We see an average. So we can see this actually spectroscopically. But that's one of the reasons why alcohols have higher boiling points, especially the smaller ones have higher boiling points than other things of comparable polarity alone without the hydrogen bonds. <coughs> Now, solubility, since alcohols are organic OH uh, combinations, um, you would expect them to have different properties depending on the ratio of OH versus organic hydrocarbon, right? Hydrocarbons are nonpolar or greasy, uh, whereas the OH group is polar. So if you think about alcohols mixing with water, being able to dissolve in water, um, you start to see solubility issues when you get longer and longer alkyl chains. So methanol and ethanol and propanol, those all are very soluble in water. They're completely miscible in, in any amounts. You'll see water dissolve in it. You'll see it dissolve in water, no problem. Uh, once you get larger than that, then you start to get a little bit more hydrocarbon content. It becomes less and less um, sol solvated by water. Okay. As a matter of fact, um, you go up to 10 carbons, and it's completely insoluble in water. And of course, larger than that would also be insoluble. So the properties, the bulk property of these alcohols also does have some effect from the organic part as well, depending on the size and things like that. 
we see that in the solubility. Okay, so the reactions, uh, the reactivity, again, as I said, it could react either as an acid or as a base, depending on what um, it's being reacted with. So if you think about reacting with a mineral acid like HCl, okay, you take alcohol plus HCl, you're going to get an acid-base reaction like this, in which the alcohol is reacting as the base, the lone pair is reacting to take the proton, right? The HCl is acting as an acid, and you protonate. We've seen this before when we've talked about doing some of the substitution reactions or elimination reactions. Uh, alcohols can be protonated with a strong acid to form now an oxygen that has a plus charge generally referred to as an oxonium ion, an oxygen with a plus charge. If it's H3O+, plus, that's a hydronium ion. So if you have an, uh, other groups, in general, it's oxonium. Any oxygen with a plus charge and three groups attached to oxonium. So we can form that um, in the presence of a strong base. If we react in the presence, if we don't have a strong base, there are a couple of things that could happen. It could react as an acid with maybe a weaker base. Um, the question is, what is the equilibrium? So in this second example, I just show an alcohol reacting with water where the alcohol is performing the function of an acid and the water is performing the function of a base. So the water is taking the proton and then the electrons go to the oxygen. That forms an oxygen with a minus charge, which we refer to as an alkoxide if it's an alkyl group, an alkoxide. If it's hydrogen, what would we call that? Hydroxide, right. If this is OH minus, it's hydroxide. If it's O alkyl minus, it's alkoxide. If it's attached to a benzene ring, Uh, no. What do we call benzene with an alcohol group? Phenol. So it's a phenoxide. See it all? It, there is some consistency. Um, now, I will say that second reaction I have here, um, alcohol reacting with water, probably isn't a very good reaction because um, the pKa's of alcohol and water are about the same. So actually, that could go either way. You could protonate the alcohol from water, or you could deprotonate the alcohol with water, probably. But the equilibrium is going to lie on the left side, mostly. This is not a huge pKa difference. As a matter of fact, if you take a look at the pKa of several different um, alcohols, you can see some, some things here. Water is listed. Here's water. Uh-oh, what am I doing? Okay. Here's water in the middle, pKa of about close to 16, 15.7. Uh, methanol is uh, almost identical, just a touch lower at 15.5. So neither one of them are going to be strongly reactive with the other if the pKa's are pretty much the same. Notice if we put more and more carbons on it, like ethanol is a little bit less acidic than water. Tertiary butanol, that looks like this. That's actually a, a couple of pKa units um, less acidic than water. That's a, a little bit more significant difference, right? It's 100 times different, 10 to the 2. Um, why do you think you put more carbons, you get uh, a less acidic alcohol? Al quick, someone have an answer? Alkyl groups are electron donating, right? We consider an electron, uh, an alkyl group is a weak electron donating group. We saw that in the benzene aromatic chemistry. Um, alkyl benzenes react faster than benzene because it's donating electrons. Carbocations with more alkyl groups are more stable because they're electron donating. Well, the same thing, uh, if you have an alcohol and you put more electron donating groups, it's going to be harder to form the O minus. So it's not going to give up the proton as easily. So it'll be less acidic. 
Consequently, if you do make the O minus, it's going to be a little more basic. But again, not much different from water. A couple of pKa units different than water. Okay. So the, all of these alcohols are within the range of water. But notice what happens when we put that OH group on a benzene ring. Paramethyl phenol. A quite significant difference down to a pKa of around 10. That's 10 to the 6th difference in, in acidity. That's 10 to the 6th times more acidic. Phenol also is below 10, 9.9 pKa. And paranitrophenol, 7.15. Now that's getting suitably acidic. So that you could deprotonate these with sodium hydroxide. Okay. A methanol reacting with sodium hydroxide, that would probably be a wash because you form water, which is about the same pKa. But this, you react with sodium hydroxide, you'll probably deprotonate completely. 7.15. So what, do you, what is it about the, <coughs> the benzene ring that makes the OH more acidic? You should know this. Conjugation, right. The difference between benzene and just having an alkoxide, if you make a phenoxide, Right? Let's say you deprotonate it. That's the ability to give up the proton. You form the um, oxide, right? Well, you can draw the resonance forms where you spread that negative charge out throughout the ring. And we've done this a lot when we talked about uh, aromatic chemistry. We've talked about a lot of uh, issues of conjugation. Okay, you can draw. Um, three resonance forms in addition to the O minus at the top, where that negative charge gets spread out. Is that room? Yeah. <coughs> Oops. Throughout the ring. Okay? And if you put, so phenol has a pKa of 9.9. .9. If you put a weakly electron donating group in the para position over here, that's going to be a little bit worse because you're putting an electron donating next to an electron uh, negative charge. It's just a touch less acidic. And if you put a good electron withdrawing group in that position, that'll even help stabilize it more. You get a significant increase in the acidity. So actually, if you take phenol and you put Three electron withdrawing groups in the orthos and para positions, you'd have a pretty darn acidic alcohol functional group. So, structure and reactivity, spreading and stabilizing of charge in a product of a reaction, in this case, deprotonation, those all matter in, in the properties. <clears throat> okay, now, because of the pKa difference, it's actually hard to make alkoxides. It's easier to make phenoxides. As I said, the pKa of phenols, and particularly with electron withdrawing groups, are such that we could use a typical base, like sodium hydroxide, and generate the phenoxides readily. Okay? That equilibrium will lie far to the right because the difference in pKa units is, uh, what, six or more. 10 to the 6 times greater acidity for the phenol than water. Okay? But we can't do that directly with methanol or ethanol or tertiary butanol. Those have similar acidities or even less acidic than water. So if you try to react with sodium hydroxide, uh, you might have a little bit of concentration in solution, but it's going to the equilibrium will lie towards the alcohol, not the alkoxide. So what do we do? Well, fortunately, there are a couple of ways in which we can prepare them directly. Uh, and both of these rely on reactions which actually generate, take the proton off and generate hydrogen gas that can then evolve from the solution. So there's no way the reaction can be reversible because the gas has gone away. Uh, one of those is you can take an alcohol such as ethanol and react it directly with the metal, sodium metal, sodium 
will have one electron. It actually donates that electron to the alcohol to form an H minus, and, an H, and that will react with an H plus from another one. Um, and overall, we'll get the formation of the sodium alkoxide and hydrogen gas. Now, this reaction isn't balanced, obviously. Uh, what we need are two equivalents of this and two equivalents of that, and we end up with two equivalents of this plus H2. So if you're to balance the equation, you need, we need uh, more than one sodium. Each one donates one electron. We need to eventually get two. Did I do that right? Okay, it's balanced. I haven't balanced the equation in a long time. An organic chemist. Um, that's one way to do it, and that works well. We can also do it with um, the, all, any of those alkali metals. Um, lithium does it. It's less reactive than sodium. So you can make the lithium alkoxide this way. You can make the sodium alkoxide this way. You could use the potassium to make the potassium alkoxide this way by using potassium metal. Uh, as you go down the periodic table in those alkali metals and reacting with water or alcohols, they become more violent. So... There are some practical limitations there. I wouldn't want to try to do this with um, cesium. That would be pretty reactive. We can also use the hydride uh, of sodium, NaH. So you can think about this as a Na plus and an H minus. Uh, now, typically, we don't have H minus flowing around or anything. But if you do have these, these alkali salts of hydride, these hydrides are pretty good bases. And particularly, this will drive the reaction because H minus will take the proton and again form hydrogen gas, which will evolve from the reaction. And there's no way the reaction could be reversible. That's another good way to make alkoxides. And in the lab, it's safer than using the sodium metal or potassium metal. So we can make these. Um, these alkoxides uh, are useful for reacting as bases for other reactions or reacting as nucleophiles. These are good for, for example, for uh, doing elimination reactions, E2 eliminations, and things like that. So they, they can be very useful. They can be used as nucleophiles to do substitution chemistry as well. So the alcohols in these cases are, are all reacting as, these are all acids in these reactions. Okay, how do we make alcohols? Well, we've seen some ways to make alcohols already. And what we see when we go through subsequent chapters and talk about different functional groups, we'll see some of the same reactions that we've seen before but in a different context. So in the alkene chapter, we talked about electrophilic addition to an alkene, and one of those ways to do electrophilic addition is to add water in a, with an acid catalyst. The product of that is an alcohol, so we have a way to make alcohols by electrophilic addition. Okay, so does anyone remember the mechanism for this reaction? What's the first step? Yes, double bond reacts with the acid, the H+. Plus. So you, electrons from the double bond takes an H+, plus from the acid catalyst. We generate an intermediate carbocation at the most stable carbon, right? The most stable carbocation. Then water adds to that carbocation. I'm drawing every step here so to remind you. I'm not going to cheat this time and just say minus H plus. Uh, this comes off in the second step, presumably by H, oops, HSO3 minus or HSO4 minus, and that takes the proton, and we get the alcohol, regenerate the acid catalyst. So acid catalyzed hydration of an alkene, 
gives you an alcohol, a tertiary alcohol, predictably because of the selectivity for forming the more substituted carbon atom. We'll talk a little bit later that um, we can do the reverse of this reaction as well, depending on the conditions. But uh, that's one way to prepare alcohols. Now that's great if you want a tertiary alcohol. And if you have an alkene, which can generate a tertiary alcohol. Okay. Uh, we could potentially do this to make a secondary alcohol, but there's no way you could do it to make methanol. And there's no way you could do it to make a primary alcohol because you can't form the carbocation. So if this was the only way we had to make alcohols, um, it would be uh, difficult because we would have only a very limited number of alcohols we could make. Another way to think about making alcohols is to add something to a CO double bond. So if we can add something to a CO double bond, uh, and replace the pi bond with a new carbon-hydrogen bond, or we'll see later a carbon-carbon bond, we can make an alcohol. Particularly if we can add hydrogen, then we have the ability to make more easily secondary alcohols, or even primary alcohols, depending on what's attached, to the carbonyl compound. Now, uh, the functional group carbonyl compound stands for anything with a CO double bond, and there are several classes of those. If they're all carbons and hydrogens in those positions, we have aldehydes or ketones. Um, if there's more functional groups like an OH group, we have a carboxylic acid. If we have a nitrogen, we have an amide functional group, and so on. There's lots of different carbonyl classes of carbonyl compounds, but what's key about them all is we have a CO double bond. Okay? So if we can take a nucleophilic hydrogen, an H minus if you will, and do a nucleophilic addition, notice this, this carbonyl compound is polarized in this direction. So it's partially plus here and partially minus there. If we could take an H minus and react at that plus carbon and break that CO double bond, and then at the end figure out how to put an H plus on that oxygen to get the OH, we can make an alcohol this way. Um, <coughs> You've seen one hydride already. You've seen an H minus, right? When we did deprotonation of an alcohol, we used sodium hydride. Right? That's a pretty good H minus. The problem is it doesn't work for this reaction. And it doesn't work because when you have alkali hydrides, NaH or KH, those react as bases, Brownsted bases, they don't react as nucleophiles. So a hydride, just like on its own, is not nucleophilic enough to react on the CO bond. We have to have a different form of hydride. Fortunately, there are a number of reagents which we can do it. And it actually turns out if you go to the uh, group 13 of the periodic table, boron, aluminum, gallium, that column, those hydrides, uh, boro hydrides or aluminum hydrides, tend to be very good to deliver a nucleophilic H minus. And so you've seen I've drawn a couple of uh, a couple of reagents here. One of them is sodium boro hydride. It's the sodium salt of BH4. Let me just draw this out for you. So it's not actually a free H minus. It's bound to boron. But, so, but boron with four bonds to it has too many bonds, right, to be neutral. So overall, this has a minus charge. The boron actually has a, a formal minus charge. So BH4 minus, the sodium is the, oops, the, sodium is the counter ion for that. So sodium borohydride uh, has some different properties than NaH. As I said, it's... It doesn't react 
very well as a Bronsted base, but it does deliver when it interacts, shoot, I keep drawing all over this, when it interacts with a carbonyl compound, it does deliver the hydrogen with its electrons to the CO double bond. And so that's a very good reagent for doing this reaction. Um, it's, it's analog, the lithium salt of the aluminum, it's structurally the same, it's just that we have aluminum instead of boron, and lithium plus instead of sodium. This reagent is much more reactive than sodium barometer. And sometimes we need something that's less reactive if we have a carbonyl compound it reacts with. Sodium borohydride is much safer. Lithium aluminum hydride is more reactive, less safe, but some carbonyl compounds aren't reactive enough and we have to use it. But those are basically the two main ways in which we can reduce a CO bond to a C, give a new CH bond um, by adding hydride. Sodium borohydride or lithium aluminum hydride. So I'm just going to show you uh, one more slide to show you how this works. Um, if we have a functional group of a carbonyl with no other electron withdrawing or electronegative atoms, like no other OH group, no other uh, N group or anything on it, uh, we could have two kinds of carbonyls. One which we refer to as an aldehyde. An aldehyde is a carbonyl where we have one carbon and one hydrogen. And uh, if it has two carbons, they could be the same or different. We call that a ketone. We saw, we've seen preparation of ketones from alkynes earlier. Uh, those carbonyls react well with sodium borohydride. So what happens, I've detailed on the top here, again, sodium borohydride delivers a hydride nucleophile, breaking the CO bond. That puts on this hydrogen and generates the alkoxide. And then in a second step, we neutralize that or add some acid some source of acid. I just put it generically as H3O plus. It could be HCl, it could be whatever we want to add. Um, you neutralize that and put the proton on the oxygen, we end up with an alcohol. And so if we have an aldehyde where we have one carbon group and one hydrogen, we end up with an alcohol with one carbon group and two hydrogens. And that would give us a primary alcohol. That's good because we can't make a primary alcohol using an addition of water to alkene. It doesn't work. It'll always give the secondary alcohol, the more stable carbocation or tertiary. If. Well, we can, though, directly make a secondary alcohol from a ketone. Now we have just two carbon groups. Same reaction. We first add that hydride reagent followed by protonation of the alkoxide, that gives us now the product where there are two carbon groups and one hydrogen, so we now have a secondary alcohol. So that's good. We have, a, uh, in addition to our ability to add water to a double bond, which is limited, now we have opened up a, a whole other range of possibilities for kinds of alcohols that we can synthesize. Okay, I'm going to stop there today. Uh, we're going to come back to this next week. I do want to remind you that Tuesday is a holiday, so it's Veterans Day. Uh, so there is no class on Tuesday. Um, it'll be a whole week before we meet again. So use that week to read up on alcohol.